Welcome to Encounters. I'm so happy that you joined us today. Today we have with us in the studio, and I'm just so thrilled to have Pastor Beth Bridger. Welcome, Thank Beth. You. I, I'm you. looking forward to your testimony and how yes. God has brought you to things. I, how you're a survivor, praise <laughs> God, and God has used you for His glory and is still using you for His mm -hmm. glory. So I'm going to read her uh, bio right quick, and we're going to get right into this because I want you to be very uh, lis uh, listening. I want you to listen in depth because this might help set you free because when you uh, hear the testimony of this woman of God and how He is walking her through it, and it is a walk-through process, and, and God, he, he manifests his glory in our lives and he opens doors for us. But this woman of God has a great testimony and I know she's an overcomer, praise God. So mother of three daughters and seven grandchildren, Beth Bridgers has had a Christian radio show for five years and a Christian television show for three years and is now going to be pastoring at Evangel Fest Church in Monita, Monita. Monita. I've done it right, <laughs> Virginia. Beth founded and directed a nonprofit ministry called the Moore Center in, is it Milan? Milan, Milan mm -hmm. Tennessee, Tennessee, for nine years mm -hmm. and a concert and crusade ministry for six years as well. Her testimony is one of surviving much abuse of different kinds. She prayed for a way of escape because of her personal relationship with Christ and was delivered from the enemy's plans against her and now grown children, Beth now teaches a program she developed for abused women called Windows and Doors. Welcome, Beth, to the Thank program to Encounters. To and I, I'm sure you've had an awesome encounter with God. I mean, He speaks to us in various ways, doesn't He? He does. Amen. He does. There's been um, countless times that I could tell you about. It would take forever to talk about the, the times that the Lord has delivered me of situations. Um, you know, when it when there's abuse, there's always a uh, it, 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 when God's in it. Mm -hmm. Let me put it that way. There's a, a, a way of escape, but it comes in stages. Yes, it's not something that happens overnight because usually when abuse becomes severe, it has gone on for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, that isn't something overnight either. And uh, the solution is just. Uh, for me, at least, and I know that I've, I've seen it and witnessed it in other mm -hmm. people's lives, is to not give up on the Lord and know Amen. that when we pray uh, that He hears us, even if the next day doesn't seem any different, to, you know, say, I know, just like Jeremiah 29, 11, mm -hmm. He's got a plan for me, and, you know, and hold on to that and know that He means it for us and our Amen. children and whomever. It could be uh, a man also mm -hmm. that's being abused. You know, it's not always the woman. We tend to think that, right. you know, but I think more and more, unfortunately, it's happening to men as well. And um, so, and the children, you know, they always get the brunt of it. Right. You know, their their first impressions are sometimes these things uh, in a marriage, and that sets a bad example for, you know, their, their future. And, uh, but one thing I've learned, Deborah, uh, is, in a, and I continue to see the Lord putting that in front of me to talk about is that it, it's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. And um, some people say they, d they don't remember it in their family. They don't know how it got in the family, mm -hmm. but it cannot, it doesn't always have to start off with, um, you know, a physical abuse. It can be a verbal mm -hmm. and then grow into something, yes. you know, that it can from generation to generation, it can intensify and become something more detrimental as the enemy right. has more of a foothold. Um, in my family, it was more, I believe, verbal. Um, in, in, in my being reared, it was verbal, but it wasn't really, really bad. Um, but it was not an emotional, there wasn't really an emotional connection in my family mm -hmm. uh, as I was growing up. But you know, as I, I've told you this before, um, you know, I got the chance to see how my grandmother uh, had lived through her eyes and things right. that she told me. And then I, the Lord began to just explain to me, you know, Beth, you can't say it's mom's fault that this happened right. to me or right. it's grandma's fault because it can keep going further and further back. Yes. And I, I think most of the time parents just do the very best that they can most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be some exceptions, but I think that's true of most. And they take into those relationships what they 
grew up around and sometimes allow even more because that opened doors there. Right. Um, spiritually speaking. And it's our job as a Christian to shut that door, yes, to amen. be the generation amen. that says no to more. To stop it. Yes. Yeah. And one of the reasons that uh, I developed the program Windows and Doors is because I had for years taught a program called Windows, which stands for Women in Need of Deliverance of the Welfare System. And really a lot of that has to do with the other, which mm -hmm. is domestic abuse that I teach with doors. And um, I think once you come into a situation where you don't really know who you are, uh, however that came about, mm -hmm. whatever caused that, um, can lead to all those other mm -hmm. things. So we, we've got to know, first of all, who we are in Christ. Exactly, yes. That's the basis, mm -hmm. that's the foundation. Our self-worth. Exactly. I, I mean, he sees, uh, we were talking on an earlier program about seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Exactly. I mean, it will open your eyes totally different. And sometimes we think, oh, how does he see me like that? And, you know, there's just no possible way, <laughs> but, but we are daughters of the king. That's right. And uh, as a daughter of the king, we are royalty. So we need to carry ourselves exactly. as we are royalty. Amen? Yes. And, you know, I'm glad you said that about the way that we carry ourselves. And, and I mean that even literally in what I'm about to say. Uh, I could walk into a room and when I, when I was living for Christ and, and then the years mm -hmm. I wasn't living for Christ, I still carried myself in a way of kind of being um, beaten down. Mm -hmm. And uh, my posture was never really good. I, I tend to do <laughs> that still. Um, I remind myself to sit up straight. But I think it's something that comes through the, the channels of our heart mm -hmm. um, when we don't feel worth much. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of generations grew up with their parents just trying to survive so they didn't get a lot of attention, maybe mm -hmm. individually. Right. And I came from a fairly large family. And I was the youngest of five girls. So um, I kind of was uh, on the sidelines a lot. And, and I don't say that against my, my parents because they were busy. They mm -hmm. were trying to do the best they could, right. just as my right. grandmother right. was with her family, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. And they had some real difficulties in surviving, just surviving. And... Um, my mother was very studious uh, in, in homemaking and all mm -hmm. of these things, and those things really, you know, I admired. Amen. But in the emotional connection was really not there. Well, I got married early on. I got married at 18, and I went to Germany for a couple of years, and uh, very lonely over there. We lived off the base, so I really wasn't around people who spoke much English. Mm -hmm. And so he was gone a lot, and then I was there with people around people who didn't speak my language. Right. So I was in real isolation yeah. <laughs> and depression got on me pretty quick. And uh, then I found out I was going to have a baby and uh, it became just me and her, you know, when she was born. And uh, he was still gone a lot with, with his duties in the army. And uh, then we came back to the States. And when we came back to the States, I had already known over there in Germany that he had had an affair. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of kept it to myself, but I, I knew. And he had admitted it in a certain sort of way without really coming right out. And, and uh, I, I felt to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. And um, then after we came back to the States and he went to work with a very well-known company and began to make much more money, um, being so young, I think he was very impressed by the world mm -hmm. so much. And the affairs continued and he traveled with that company. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was just really working against what I already started off with, mm -hmm. low self-esteem, self mm -hmm. you know, it was already uh, getting worse. And um, I forgave a, a few times and then finally just confronted him. And he told me he was in love with that particular one and that he was, he was leaving. And a few weeks after that, it was over with, and he wanted to come back home. But all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, no, you know, right. I'd had so much of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we divorced. And um, in between my first and second marriage, um, I encountered a home invasion rape. And I lived out in the country. And uh, uh, someone had come to the office where I worked and talked a little while, and I didn't really think much about the things that I was saying. Um, I wasn't interested in him, but I wasn't thinking about the things that I was saying that were kind of letting him know my situation, mm -hmm. uh, just because I was talking to him about ministry and it being a single parent ministry and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, 
uh, he just began to uh, linger that mm -hmm. day a little too long and you know finally he left and a couple of weeks later someone knocked at my door and um, I thought it was my mother because she had been there earlier mm -hmm. and left her sweater and when she came uh, to the door I didn't has I mean when he came to the door I didn't hesitate you know or look out because I thought she was coming right back for her sweater right and um, I opened the door up and it was him well, I had a six-year-old from that previous marriage, and she was in the bedroom with the door closed, which is something that I did not normally do, but because my mother had been there, I closed it so she could sleep. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't witness anything, and, um, but because of the fact that I was living, trying to live a holy life, right. and uh, before the Lord, I wasn't you know, active in premarital sex, and I wasn't on the pill or anything, I became pregnant from that rape. And so I had um, given birth to um, another child and uh, kept her and glad that I did. And, um, and then uh, after that, I married again. And the a marriage that was the second marriage was probably the hardest. Um, the first one was more of an emotional abuse. And the second one, of course, there was the rape in between, which was abuse, uh, a, a very bad. But then the the second marriage was more um, physical, and I'd already gone through that with the rape. But I didn't, I didn't really understand that in marriage, and it was, it was alcohol involved, and yet I had met him in church. Mm. So you don't think, right. you know, I mean, he was going to Bible school. You just don't think those things are going to ever come about. You know, you talk them through, you, you talk about your past, and you think, well, the Lord has healed all this, you know. Now, throughout this, uh, was there anyone that you could talk to or, or seek counseling from, or, mm -hmm. or was that, or was it just you were on your own? No, I mean I was in church, and you yeah. know there were very variable situations. Um, not every time, you know, with every situation, where I felt comfortable with that. But I think, in a way, the fact that I didn't get what I thought I needed later, when I could see hindsight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is why I do what I do today and mm -hmm. why I want to. Um, but I did have people who would encourage me. I had great prophetic words over my life. I mean, time and time again, uh, the Lord would speak to me through others, but I didn't necessarily have that constant uh, person to go to. Now, right, right. You know, uh, and I, I found out I was in ministry when I was raped. I mean, I was in a single parent ministry, had started one mm -hmm. in, my, in my church. And I think that when you're in a situation like that, sometimes you don't reach out you know, mm -hmm. when you're scared or, or you're just needing to talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt that. I felt that it was better for me not to because mm -hmm. when I would try to, it was kind of like, well, you know, how did you get yourself into that situation? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it would turn it around. And it would, I felt like I was explaining myself. Right, you know, right. I mean, uh, we were just saying on a previous program, sometimes people just need you to listen and not even mm -hmm. say a thing. <laughs> but uh, some, sometimes... Uh, I feel like through the carnality and stuff, and there are carnal Christians, yeah. and, and they will, uh, like you said, uh, what did you do to get yourself in that situation type mm -hmm. of thing? Mm -hmm. But uh, praise God that you you had God hold on to the whole time. Amen. I did, and Amen. I think I learned. Um, I think He allowed that. Yes. As as lonely as it was, and still can be sometimes, I believe He has put me in a position at times to be alone, um, only. Uh, because that pulls something out of me mm -hmm. to want that for others. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, and, yes. And, I, and I, that's how sometimes we get our ministries is through mm -hmm. our hardships and right. through our, what we realize is needed. And I think it's especially needed for women in ministry because many of them, including myself, at times attend, like I said earlier, to pull back from getting that help that they may need right. or talking because you don't know who you can trust and you don't exactly. want those things... Go out there unless right, it's something right. the Lord has already. Now, you know. in part of your bio, you mentioned that at one point in time that you worked at an abortion clinic. I did. <laughs> you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd I, I love to share about it. Um, I did not go there understanding abortion. I was very young, and uh, the money was very good for someone my age. I was probably 22, 23, and... Um, I, I had been a receptionist at a law firm, and you know I knew how to be a receptionist, but they also asked me to be a counselor. 
And I already knew that I wanted to do something along those lines, but I didn't know exactly what that was. Mm -hmm. So it attracted me. Mm -hmm. But my sister also uh, was a nurse for a pro-life doctor. And when I told her about it, she was like, Beth, do it because we know things are going on in there that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can help us out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went into it kind of mission-minded, you know, yeah. but I really didn't understand abortion. The only thing was that they made me the person at night uh, to explain with the model figures exactly what happens. Mm. So I was learning everything that I had questions about right. by my own instruction and what I was being taught to say. I was not allowed to say baby. I was not allowed to say anything but fetus. Uh, there was a lot of no-no's on what you say and don't mm -hmm. say. You can only point to Catholic services on the bulletin board and tell them if they want to read it, they can read mm -hmm. it. You know, it's not, well, this particular right. place, it was not right out there for them. And so they kind of had to do their own searching. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the place <clears throat> is not in business anymore, but ironically, uh, and this is in a different state, it's called Alternatives. And I remember thinking, they're saying alternatives, but they're really not giving them mm -hmm. alternatives, you know? And so anyway, I began to pray with these ladies. And I, they had put me alone at night to do the counseling part. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a lot of freedom. Opportunity. And the church, yes, Amen. and the church that I went to uh, had a radio station. And so I would turn that on in the, the uh, foyer, you know, where they waited. And, um, which is very interesting to some of them. <laughs> they would come in and, and be like, um, isn't this an abortion clinic? I'm, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I'm praying with them. I'm sure they were thoroughly confused. But I would pray with them and say, you know, I believe that God wants me to pray and help you through this. You know, I mean, it's your decision. I can't make it for you. But let's pray if you're willing to pray. And some of them didn't want anything to do with that, and some of them did. And um, anyway, eventually, the, the nurse who assisted the doctor, which was also her husband, um, found out because they had, I don't know if they deliberately did it, but somebody came in with their daughter. Mm -hmm. And as I was praying and wanting to, to talk to them about it being a baby, uh, this woman that had brought her daughter in uh, eventually had gone and told them what I said. Mm -hmm. And she was a nurse that did live births at mm -hmm. the hospital with the abortionist. So, you know, I got caught yeah. <laughs> four months in. And uh, the nurse came at night when I was counseling people and when no one was in there. She took her keys, of all things, and threw them in my face. Mm -hmm and said, get out, and, I, and the peace of God just, I mean, it was like he was right behind me and just stepped in and wow. just put his arms around me, and I, I smiled in the most, it wasn't sarcastic, it wasn't angry, I just smiled at her with the love of God, mm. and my face was hurting, because yeah. <laughs> she'd thrown her keys at me, and I just smiled, I said, okay, you know, and I got my things and I walked out, but one thing that I had prayed when I was there, and I had, by this time, anointed every seat in that entire place Amen. and the procedure tables and uh, everywhere. And one thing that I knew was that it had affected some of the people that had come in there because mm -hmm. they would sometimes just pop up and leave mm -hmm. and not even stay. I had one of them walk up to me and she said, I don't know, I was sure this is what I wanted, but I cannot do this to my child. And Amen. she left. And Amen. so, but uh, of, as of several months later, um, I had prayed, I remembered that I had prayed this when I was in there, that God would turn that place someday into a place for children to help them and not, you know, hurt them. Right. And uh, then I just kind of forgot about it all and I went on with my life and a few months later there was an accident uh, and I read about it. My mother actually read about it and told me, she said, isn't this the building that you used to work in? And I said, yeah, and I'm looking at the paper and my brother-in-law was there, and he looked at it, and he said, that's, a, that's the abortion clinic that you worked in. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I heard about that. Uh, somebody was taking their mother home from the hospital, and they were right, the hospital was right down the road, and they were drunk when they went to get her, and they went right through the building. Wow. Well, no one was hurt or killed, uh, maybe a little injured, but the whole front of the building was demolished. And so what they had to do, fortunately, no one was in there mm -hmm. when it happened. It was in the evening. And uh, so what they had to do was restore the front of the building. Well, the abortion clinic did not want to wait for that 
-hmm. restoration to be done to the building, so they went somewhere else. And that building, it took them a, a while to restore it, but my same brother-in-law that was there talking with me uh, went to work there as a special needs instructor mm. for a special needs Price God. school. <laughs> Praise God. And that's what it became. See, God positions and things. I believe he puts us, he positions us sometimes and places us sometimes in places we don't want to be in, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's a reason. There's yeah. a reason for him having us there, yeah. and that's to be a light and, and to, to share God's love and, you know, to be able to counsel and pray with, you know, with women or girls that came in there. Right. And I'm sure to this day, uh, some that didn't follow through with the abortion um, will remember it at times because of Absolutely. something you said, praise yeah. God. Well, let's move forward a little bit till, uh, to, uh, we'll go through the Moore Center, exactly what you, um, what you did there, and then we'll go on to your pastoring today. Okay. Um, well, let me just say real quickly that uh, years later, about 15 years later, I did have an abortion and I had been away from the Lord for about two years. So I had tremendous guilt because I knew better. And um, I'm not going to say that, you know, any excuses mm -hmm. because, you know, mm -hmm. I had to just get that right with the Lord. I wasn't very far along, but that doesn't matter, you know, that it was conceived at that moment of conception. And I know that, and I was away from the Lord, but let me just say really quickly that it, it doesn't take long when you get away from the Lord to just get into sin. Right, right. And that's what happened. Um, and again, that self-esteem issue, mm -hmm. you know, and wanting to be loved, and that can be a cycle. So um, anyway, uh, what happened with the Moore Center was um, I had moved from the Fairview area into Milan, and I had become very sick with Lyme disease. And I felt uh, the Lord just, you know, in my life speaking to me, but about things, but I'm thinking how, you know, it looks like everything is just topsy-turvy, you know, mm -hmm. so how in the world could you do ministry in me now? Now this had been a long time after mm -hmm. those other things, but um, it seemed like the, the, the worst time in the world. <laughs> the yes, yeah. it was like, are you sure? You know, this doesn't make sense. It absolutely made no sense uh, financially. It made no sense in any way. And, um, but one day I was going through McDonald's and I looked over and I saw a for rent sign as I was in the drive through mm -hmm. I looked over and saw the for rent sign on this, uh, this building. And for some reason I went over there and I just felt like something, uh, uh, some, <laughs> something was um, just drawing me uh -huh. to go and call mm -hmm. that number. And I thought, this just does not make sense, mm -hmm. you know. So I went over there and I called and the person that answered was in another state at that time. And he told me that he would be back in 10 days and we could talk. Well, I hadn't really gone into things with him too much. And so I prayed for the next 10 days very hard. And then when I whenever we met and talked, uh, the room was just a mess. I mean, it was, the whole building was just a mess. And I knew that the Lord was telling me to be there, or I felt that, mm -hmm. but when he told me what it would cost, I knew I couldn't do it. And so I'm, I said, well, Lord, you know, I, and, and even to the gentleman, I just said, well, I don't know why I came. You know, I said, I'm sorry, I wasted your time because there's no way. And he said, I, I have felt that someone was coming in here with a ministry. Wow. And he said, so what if you cleaned all this up and got the plumbing taken care of back in the back and, uh, you know, I'll give you three months free rent. And I knew the moment that he said it, that that was God. Amen. Amen. I could already, in my Amen. mind, I could see myself doing something, cleaning up and getting it ready, you know. And, and you get so excited about it, you know, I really didn't even when know God what I was going to do. Right. I didn't really know. I mean, I had these things in my mind because I'd had a vision in 1984, uh -huh. and which was the same year that my daughter was born, the one that came from that, that situation that I was talking about. And, uh, and there again, the worst time in the world, but God gave me a vision yes. during yes. that very difficult period mm -hmm. of my life. Well, it was 20 something years later before it actually came into fruition. fruition. Amen. But then when it did, I, I just, it was like just falling into place in stages. And even when he told me, you know, you can have this place and in three months you, you can start paying rent. Amen. I just knew that God was going to take it Amen. from stage to stage. Amen. And, and I know that you uh, helped many of the people 
through that. It was more, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And today, just recently, mm -hmm. you started pastoring, praise God. Mm -hmm. God is so awesome how he brings us from glory to glory yeah. to glory, <laughs> how he ministers to us in, in the right season, the due season, and we will, we will reap what we have sown. That's right. Amen. I, That's right. You know, I'm a full believer in uh, we reap what we sow. And if we'll just yeah. hold on, Beth, mm -hmm. if we'll just hold on, That's right. <laughs> God will manifest His glory. And people are going to wonder sometimes, you know, how in the world did she do it? How in the world did she do it? It's by the grace of God because you didn't give up. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you didn't back up. You didn't retreat. You didn't turn around. And, and, you know, we just got to learn to do that, don't we? Yes. Amen. We do. And, and during that time, people wanted to know my testimony because I had mm -hmm. opened the doors up there to help pay people's electric right. bills and thrift store right. and all that. And that's how I got into radio and Amen. television. Well, bef before we uh, uh, leave today, uh, do you have a website? I or, do. Or, or contact information. If you I will do. just look in that camera right there mm -hmm. and share okay. with them the, the information. It's evangelfest.tv. Real simple. Uh, it's still, it's not quite updated because it was about the television show mostly. Now it's going to be more about the church. And, uh, but we have the address is P.O. Box 613, Monita, Virginia, 24121. And uh, you can write us there and find out and get brochures and just find out anything about the church. And Amen. I know the Lord is going to bring us back to television. I don't know when, radio too. And right. he, I was just praying about it on the way here. And I felt the Lord say, you know, all in my time. Amen. And so Amen. We'll, and we'll he will that. in the right season and the due That's right. season. That's right. Praise God. So uh, there are many of you out there I know that you may have experienced some of the things that Beth has experienced and came through and God has brought through. If you would like to contact her, contact her through that information. Mm -hmm. And it's a, um, a worthy ministry to, uh, uh, if you'd like to donate to it so that she can help others. Uh, I'm sure they would be blessed and, and thankful for that and, and be grateful for it. Amen. So I want you to know today, no matter what your circumstance, no matter what you're going through today, rely and stand on the promises of God. Continue to lift him up. Don't be moved by what's going on around you. Be moved only by what the word of God says about your circumstance. Amen. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Be joyous, be victorious, walk in peace. Until next time, walk in love, and I want you to keep your faith. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. Encounters is sponsored by Vessels of Honor Worldwide, AAA Enterprises, and the viewers. like to contact Encounters, email encounterswithgod at comcast.net or write to us at 117 Sunset Place, Portland, Tennessee 37148.